What is up, everybody? Welcome to the March 2024 Tidal Gardens YouTube live show. This one might be a little bit of a struggle bus for me because I am just now recovering from some kind of cold or flu or something that must have been going around. I've been sick for about a week and I feel perfectly fine. But I have kind of like this, this tingle, this itch in my lungs as I'm trying to like get everything cleared out. So every now and again, I just like go into a coughing fit. So unfortunately, I have to kind of like step away every now and again, but otherwise doing well. Yeah, I think I got sick um, maybe like a week and a half ago, give or take. I had gone out to dinner with a friend and literally while we were at dinner, I'm pretty sure I got food poisoning because it was like, this isn't quite right. And so I purged immediately and continued my evening. Like that didn't stop me because usually like once I get the food poisoning out, it's fine. The next day though, I kind of had like this scratchy throat and I was thinking, oh, well, maybe it's because of the food poisoning and, you know, that was just like some rawness from having thrown up the night before. But the more I kind of sat around with it, it was like, no, because it's in my lungs. I can kind of feel it starting in my lungs and usually that's when I know it's like, oh, great. It's going to be at least seven to ten days before I'm going to start feeling normal again. And yeah, for a little while there, it was very bad. Like, I I tested for COVID, COVID negative, but I could tell that I had a fever because I got the chills and then the fever dream started. And that is like the most frustrating thing about being that sick. It's like, I must have been like a, you know, a couple degrees hot because... Like the brain just stops working. Like just the utter nonsense that you're just thinking when you're having fever dreams. I'm like, ah, just the worst. Hard to get to sleep and your mind is just like churning away on dumb stuff. Like uh, I think at one point all I could think about was just like stacking um, those like pull off tabs you get from like pop cans. Yeah, it's like very productive thinking. So anyway, guys, um, I am doing much better now. But again, I've kind of got this persistent cough that I have to work through. So hopefully things will go relatively smoothly in the next couple hours, but I don't know. Don't get your hopes up. We usually do like to get stuff started a little bit earlier on these shows to make sure uh, things are working correctly. Hopefully this monologue you guys could actually hear. That would be nice, right, if the audio worked. This particular stream um, is different. <clears throat> not because I'm like, you know, struggling with the, with the remnants of a cold, but I have a, a newer beefed up internet connection. They call it gig, but it's not like fiber optic. So what does that mean? It means I can download really fast, but the upload speed isn't that much better than what it was. However, it is better enough that I can upload a much more data-rich stream. So, guys, uh, most of you guys are watching on phones, probably. I don't even know if it matters. But um, the source file for this particular thing is, um, is done in 4K, and I believe the broadcast is going to be in 144p if you guys have that ability. So it should look kind of nice. We'll see. The thing about um, the bigger data rate isn't so much that the resolution is better. I mean, having better resolution, sure, that's always nicer. But I'm hoping for better color depth because in the past, when you're data constricted, what tends to look more potato is the imagery. It's the the richness of the colors. So oftentimes it just looks a little flatter in a way. Hard to describe unless you see the alternative. But starting with like a, 
with like a nice beefy data file and seeing what eventually shows up on a YouTube live stream, it can be a little bit disappointing, but most everybody else never knows. So what is up you guys? Thanks for coming and hanging out with me. <laughs> Matt Smoyer, what is up? James Green. Travertine Pico, what is up guys? Hillbilly Reefer. What is up Be the Fountain and the Fish Fam Link? So we still have about four minutes left. Um, so I'm assuming that you guys can hear me okay since nobody has complained about no audio. Uh, let's say some quick highs and hellos and thank yous to first the Patreon folks. So we have Elaine Martinassi, Aline Barley, Alan Jackson, Ann Lewis, Brandy Camp, Chuck Admire, Greg, Greg Zimmerman, Harkins Aquatics, ICP Test Hub, Jordan Marty, Keith Singer, Kyle Jamison, Lisa Clow, Lacry Fine Art, uh, Lynn Holt, Puddle Aquatics, Ryan Baker, Scott Williams, Skylar Korn, and Sue Hemmons. On the YouTube member side of things, we have William Heights, Carlos Fernandez, Chris Jordan, Steven13, Mike Downey, Keith Holland, Terry Kuhn, Herb777, Justin Harden, and Ohio Ventures. Okay, thank you guys so much. And thank you to our, currently our only corporate sponsor, that being Polyp Lab. Thank you guys so much. <clears throat> I'm in discussions for some other uh, corporate sponsors, but... I'm not fishing that hard, to be perfectly honest. Uh, there, there's a few uh, companies that are interested um, that have reached out. There's one or two that I've reached out to. It's like companies that we've like worked with forever. We shall see. Okay. Ah. <clears throat> <sighs> Billy Reefer says, I hope you feel better. I suggest alcohol. I don't know if that's a great idea or not. I uh, I went out with a friend and he was uh, he was showing me around like his uh, his town where he's doing like a lot of work. He does a lot of like the local economic development type stuff there. Went out for uh, for a couple of cocktails <clears throat> and that night, by the way, this is about like eight minutes, eight days into the whole illness thing. And, I, and again, I'm, I'm feeling like way, way better. But I was out and about with him. I had like a couple of drinks. And that evening, I was like, I have the chills again. It's like, I really hope I just didn't get another fever. Luckily, um, the next day, everything was cleared up again. So small victories, I guess. But more cocktails? Probably not. Okay, guys, we have a minute 30 before we start the choral portion of the show. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think if there's anything really new going on here. Not a ton. A lot of the projects that I'm like excited and working on don't really have a whole lot to do with the aquariums. Um, I'm doing like more sound control stuff, which is super exciting to me, very much not exciting to literally anybody else. Um... Tanks are doing good. Can't complain there. I mean, it's always a, a grab bag of like 99% of everything is doing well. And then it's always that 1% where you're just like, <sighs> can't make everybody happy, I guess. But you kind of get that when you have these like large homogenized systems and the variety of corals that we keep here, it's hard to expect everything is going to be happy under the same conditions right so there's a few corals that are just like not having it but it's very few pretty much everything else is adjusted nicely <clears throat> my parents had gone out to the to the local uh, cvs to um to get me some cough drops so i'm very much looking forward to that <laughs> Okay, hopefully we had a smooth transition there. 
excuse me. All right, live show has started. Enjoy, you guys. So let's see. Um, one thing that's kind of the, the, the sickness has put a wrench in is any and all video content on my end of the thing, on my end of the spectrum, because I, I got out the one where uh, I was talking about whether it's possible to have an aquarium that's too clean, but I was working on a very long, like, hour and 20-minute podcast, and there's just no ability to mentally focus when you're, like, when you have a fever. So that didn't go anywhere at all. Um, so I'm working on that video. Uh, Becca is working on another podcast that she and I shot together. And so that is all about like photography. Um, there is a couple other videos that I want to shoot, including like a building update. But as long as like I'm struggling with this, that's going to have to like take a back seat for just a little while longer. Um, I think in like a couple weeks, I don't know exactly when. I think in, in a couple of weeks, um, I'm going to be having some out of town guests. And we're going to shoot some more podcasty type content. That'll be interesting because we're going to be talking about um, about fish, something that we don't typically do a lot here with. Um, frankly, we struggle getting in fish, and so that podcast is going to be as much for me as it is for you guys because it is something that we've always struggled with, and we're always looking for ways to do that better. <clears throat> Yay, I think that my cough drops have arrived. Oh, no. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So we have some Ricola. <laughs> Hopefully, this will help. <clears throat> okay, let's go into some questions, y'all. Are you guys working on automatic water change systems? <clears throat> Excuse me. So, no. That's not typically something that we dabble with. Um, I like the idea of them. I think that is more appropriate for hobbyist systems than it is for commercial. Um, so for the folks out there that are kind of unfamiliar with what a, a continuous water change system is or an automated water system, automated water change system, you essentially have um, two, dosing two dosing pumps. And when it's time to do a water change, one will remove water down to your drain and at the same time, the other dosing pump will feed uh, newly made salt water into your system. So usually, <clears throat> like 5 to 10% a day perhaps, which could be aggressive, but 5% not so much. And the nice thing is, is especially if you are not the best at keeping up with the water change schedule, this will just make sure that that, um, that water transfer is getting done. Um, <clears throat> why do I think that it's better for home hobbyists than it is for here? Is because we effectively have a continuous micro water change system in, in place because we ship out corals. And we're always kind of removing water and refilling. So we accomplish the same thing, but without that technology layer, we just do it with labor. Um, it is nice. It is nice, uh, but we wouldn't really benefit from, from that as much. And especially once you have like 10 separate systems, that would be an additional 20 um, dosing pumps. At some point, it just gets cumbersome. So for us, it is very much manual. But if it is something that you guys are interested in implementing, it is very, very easy because the nice thing about peristaltic pumps is that you're able just to deliver water from like 30 feet away 
and uh, send water down to your drains very, very easily, that the plumbing is very easy. <clears throat> Salty Farms. I am struggling with calcium for some reason. Good magnesium and alkalinity. Um, the nice thing about calcium is you can just add in a calcium additive, like calcium chloride. Before you do that, I would encourage getting another opinion on that. Try a different test kit. Your chemistry might be fine. One time we were trying to chase down one particular figure, like it was pH. Our pH was chronically low. It turns out our pH wasn't chronically low. We just had a bad pH probe. So double check your figures before you go crazy. Um, other than that, it is something that can be easily remedied. And on top of all that, as long as you keep your uh, parameters steady, it's really not as important to like hit a specific level for something like calcium. Be the fountain. My platy cakes is down colored. I wonder why. It was doing so well for so long. Um, Ryan and Sandra Coots. Coots? Coots? Do you guys allow for pickup for purchases made? Yes, just down the road in Wadsworth. We do. Uh, every visit here is done by appointment. So once you're done purchasing and whatnot and you would like to come pick up, we'll just set us set aside some time. We'll get you on the calendar. That's it. Excited to see you at the Aquatic Expo. Yes. So I've got a couple of bits of travel um, on my schedule. I'm going to be going to Charlotte for the Aquatic Expo. Don't know the date off the top of my head. I'm sure somebody in chat will say. I'm also going to be going to Aquashella, Dallas. And... I'm trying to think of anything else aquarium related that I'll be going to for the rest of the year. Nothing officially, but I might be going to um, something in Chicago. But nothing, but that Chicago trip is not on the books just yet. <clears throat> Dangles. Another dive spot suggestion for the TG dive trip. How about the Philippines? I've seen some really cool pictures of the Philippines, and I know that um, a couple of YouTube creators have gone there, and it looks very, very nice. I have never been. Fan in Charlotte is a big deal for us. Technically, I go to Charlotte a lot. I'm always getting a connecting flight at CLT. <laughs> but um, yeah, I guess I don't exactly leave the airport much in Charlotte. Platy cakes, maybe because I did a water change, or maybe I need to do more. Well, you know, our platy cakes had um, had down colored for a few months, and I think it is likely a chemistry thing, but it could also be a coral aggression thing. Sometimes we have it too close to something else that might be stinging it. But uh, what has seemed to have helped us is paying a little bit closer to attention to. Um, trace elements. I really didn't want trace elements to be such a big deal because it is just one more thing that you know you can kind of go down the rabbit hole with and obsess about potentially needlessly. <coughs> Excuse me. But it really did help once we just started to add more trace elements in. If you guys already didn't know, um, our strategy with trace elements is not super refined. We do uh, ICP testing and whatnot, but our goal is just to try to get numbers off of zero, not trying to hit specific numbers, just to make sure that something isn't totally bottomed out. Um, once we started to dabble with that, a lot of corals that were struggling a little bit perked up. So. Well, that could be part of the issue. 
Excuse me. <clears throat> Howard asks, Hi, hope you feel better. Trying to. Uh, my water quality seems stable, but I struggle keeping tortures, hammers, and elegance. Am I missing something? Um, possibly. So, torches, hammers, and elegances. They can be susceptible to a number of things that's not related to water chemistry. They could be getting harassed by something in your tank. There's always the possibility of some sort of pest or like and pest really breaks down to some kind of flatworm typically or something really exotic like um, hmm, ostracods possibly things like that. Ciliates. But also they are um, susceptible to bacterial infection. So if any of those things are possible, one thing that I like to try is reef primer <clears throat> because a lot of the stuff that, that, is, um, that is kind of prevalent with those three things, reef primer does do a good job with, especially things like flatworms. Certain flatworms... Uh, they are tougher to get rid of because they will do like really creepy stuff like they'll crawl into the mouth of like a torch or a hammer and survive dips but we've been um we've been able to do a lot of more effective like longer dips at higher concentrations using reef primer so that's something that i might consider also, reef primer does have some antimicrobial activity to it, so if there was like an ongoing infection, that might help a lot. <clears throat> a dedicated reefer. I was hoping to see you at Rap New York. So there's two uh, upcoming reefapaloozas, and unfortunately, I won't be able to go to either of them. One was in Orlando, and there was a scheduling conflict where there's something. There's like guests flying in that we were going to do um, some podcast stuff here for that was for Orlando. For New York, that is my birthday weekend, and there is there are people flying in for an event here for that. So unfortunately, no luck. Oh, Aquashella Chicago is a little up in the air. I mean, you would think that that would be an easier one to attend. Um, it's still a possibility. I've got several things that I want to do in Chicago, separate from Aquashella, and uh, there might be like multiple trips to Chicago already, and I may or may not be able to do that particular event. <clears throat> Excuse me. Look dashing, chief. I wish. I've been looking really rough lately. For the folks that are uh, joining a little bit late, um, I'm battling um, a little bit of a cold or a flu or something that's been going around. I did an ICP baseline for a five-month-old tank. Salinity was up around 31 ppt. Got re reference water, and sure enough, refractometer was off. Luckily, tank still looked good. Calibrate, calibrate, calibrate. Yeah, that's important. Um, we have like multiple ways to test a lot of things, and we try to um, to get like a, a more roundabout picture for everything, a well-rounded picture. Because we have had like the single one-off test that just doesn't make any sense. And if that was the only data point, that could have been disastrous because we would have tried to do something that was unnecessary. Um, like one thing in particular, we only had like a, a single pH probe and we thought that we were dealing with low pH. We were not. pH was fine. But um, yeah. <clears throat> It's good to double check your results before you start taking other action.
Dangles, are you a watch guy by chance? To some degree, yes. I'm like a I'm like a small watch collection guy. If you're curious, this is a, a Cartier Tank America. Um, I I started to realize that I only wore three watches, so I'm kind of gonna be selling off the rest of my collection. And of those three watches, I really only wear one watch, and the other two are kind of like specialty stuff. But yes, I, I do like watches quite a lot. Salty Farms. My dog is barking at Than. I should post it. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm a cat person, but I do like dogs as well. Name Beats. Whatever happened to Rico? That's a good question. I know that his wife took ill and has since recovered from um, from breast cancer. But, <clears throat> but since that time, he stopped making videos. Ryan and Sandra Coutts. Coots counts. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna be Ryan and Sandra. I'm a huge believer in UV sterilizers. Not a lot to believe. I mean, UV light does the things. When my euphilia start to have question marks, I always check that first. My brown jelly showed up after UV ball burnout without me knowing. I happen to like UV sterilizers quite a lot. I just don't like um, having to maintain the bulbs. That kind of gets annoying. But the effectiveness of the technology itself, to me, is a no-brainer. Um, I even had like one system here that we were running a very large protein skimmer, like a very large protein skimmer. We also were running ozone through said large protein skimmer. And the, the water had like this bacterial haze to it. And part of that is because, you know, the, our nutrients were very low in that entire system, like zeros, which is not good. But it was, it was a relatively new system, low bio load, so hardly any phosphate nitrate. So we just had this, like, cloud of bacteria. Stuck an 80-watt UV on that thing, and within a day, it's just crystal clear. So I love that stuff. And if you are running ozone, UV is a really nice thing to break down free ozone that's still in the water. Because um, the O3 bond in ozone, very reactive. That's kind of the point of ozone. It's, it's highly oxidative. And when you hit that with UV, that bond instantly breaks. It's how the ozone layer works. It, uh, it, it blocks up UV. <clears throat> oh, I have a quick question. I have a green bubble tip anemone, but it's slowly losing its bubble and becoming spaghetti-like. Any advice is appreciated. There's really no advice to talk about. These anemones do their own thing. It's unclear to me what causes uh, an anemone to bubble versus not bubble. But I also, I don't think that it really has any impact on the health of the anemone. Anemones are going to do what anemones do. Coats. Ryan and Sandra Coats. There you go. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. So... What else is going on that's kind of interesting? <laughs> Once I get my um, my pet project of sound paneling done, which should take like a couple weeks, I can once again do a deep dive into cleaning my place up here, the, the, the tank specifically. We were on like a really good stretch because it was like multiple weeks in a row that I was having out of town guests coming in. And we were very much on top of keeping the tanks clean, especially me. I was personally siphoning between 60 to 120 gallons per day out of the systems. 
And that's not just like me pumping out 120 gallons. That's like me detail siphoning stuff out. So that's like removing like piles of detritus that had built up. If there was any kind of like crud that's been growing on like a vertical surface, um, scraping coralline algae, swapping trays out because, uh, you know, we like to keep the trays practically unsustainably clean here, but it's good practice in a farm. And once I got sick, all of that stopped. Luckily, you don't have to be insanely clean. Um, and our tanks are actually pretty darn clean regardless. But like I said, for a little while there, it was crazy, crazy clean. And that is a nice palate cleansing reset every now and again. Uh, it's just one of those things in a coral farm where stuff would probably be just fine, but the cleaner that you can keep stuff, it sets a, a baseline that you're able to diagnose a lot of other issues with. And so I would like to get back, get back to doing that in a little bit, but I guess like between me getting sick and then me having this upcoming pet project. It could be just a little bit of time, but then we are having some guests from out of town coming in. And so I do want to um, get the tanks nice and clean for them. <clears throat> Danny fam, best way to deal with brown jelly disease. That is a toughie. Um, honestly, a lot of people aren't going to like it, but antibiotics work. Currently trying to get Cipro to dose, but anything I can do in the meantime. Um, a lot of times it really is just about culling the, um, the affected corals. Because brown jelly is kind of like, it's kind of like Ebola. I mean, it's so virulent. It's so good at just killing the thing that's infected with it that it's kind of nice in a sense that it just doesn't typically just like hang out but if you're just having like years and years and years and years and years of, of issues with this it's probably a good thing just to uh, just to cull the colony one more question I'm interested in starting a frag tank how would you go about cycling the tank or is the approach to a frag tank different okay <clears throat> this might just be like an anecdotal hot take for me, but it's something that like long time reefers just kind of know that seems like really counterintuitive. Really the best way to cycle a tank if you're like a coral guy is just to put tons of coral into the tank like day one. It's so counter counterintuitive. Like, and even us, the last big system that we did, we let that thing sit for almost like six months to a year before adding anything. And that's a dumb way to do it. There's no reason for us to do that. But that is what we did. And it had all kinds of like nuisance problems. And it's just from having like this blank surface for, for stuff to grow on with no real, um, no real bio load in there. Uh, if I were to do it again, I would have stuffed every coral that I could like wrangle up from other systems, give it a dip prophylactically, get it all in there. Because once we started to stack those tanks full of coral, all of our problems went away. This is also a discussion that I had with um, one of my friends. She is a wholesaler of corals in the UK. And I was talking to her about um, <clears throat> about cycling tanks, and then she's just like, "Don't you don't cycle it with just tons of coral?" And I'm like, "No, I guess I just don't." It's been a long time since I did do have to do any cycling, but she's, she's like, "Yeah, just throw a bunch of coral in there." Similarly, um, when I visited like the Reef Builder Studio a few years back, um, I visited Jake, and Jake was the same. He was just like, "Yeah, just." throw tons of corals in there. So if you're looking to do a frag tank, literally just throw all your tanks, throw all your frags into the tank. It'll be fine. Hey, 
Hey, Than. Hope you're doing fine. Eh, getting over a cold. Question. I've been fighting acro-eating flatworms with potassium chloride. Doing out-of-tank treatment. Do you think they'll rebound if I do a six-week treatment while dipping the scape each week? Um, I think that if you are diligent with your dipping, you will get to the other side. Um, it can be a challenge, though, because I think that sometimes we overestimate how diligent we're actually dipping. It becomes a bigger problem in bigger tanks. The dipping, especially with potassium chloride um, or any kind of potassium salt thing like corporate sponsor, you know, um, the polyp lab product, reef primer, um, that stuff really does a good job of killing flatworms. But you do have to, like, you know, really nail the regimen. And it is gentle enough that I wouldn't be worried about losing acros. Having said that, occasionally we will run into um, certain acros where it's just like they are so chronically um, dealing with acro eating flatworms. It is, it's better for us just to, like, throw those away than it is to try to constantly keep on trying to dip these things. Um, it might sound like it's <clears throat> it might sound like it's a really drastic step, but for us that has like so many other acros at risk, it's like this particular acro is like such a problem with being like a like a host for those uh, flatworms. It's like not worth it. Just get it out of here. Um, but everything else we we can dip aggressively and get on top of. Courtney, the husband is headed to Oahu soon. Kind of jealous. I love Hawaii. I've been doing research to hopefully find some nice snorkeling spots for him to visit. Do you have any scuba or snorkeling plans or places you'd like to visit? A lot of places that I would like to visit. Um, top of the list for me would probably be Okinawa. The time that I was in Okinawa and got to do some diving, it was a torrential rainstorm and so the boat the, the dive boats were like we're gonna go like five minutes offshore so that you don't die and i'm like that's cool let's do that uh so i was able to see some really really cool stuff but i guess like the really cool stuff is when you can actually get out there but it was a straight up storm <laughs> so no such luck um, in and around Oahu, uh, that is tougher. I wouldn't bother doing any snorkeling in Oahu, to be perfectly honest. All this, there's so many people in Oahu that's like snorkeling sucks. However, the dive places can hook you up with some cool dives. Jude Clark, get well soon. Thank you. How do I get rid of heavy metals out of my reef tank? There are certain um, pads that can do some kind of like chemical bonding. Um, I know Two Little Fishies makes a product that it's kind of like some kind of chemisorb or something. Perhaps somebody in the comments can help you with that. I don't know the exact name of it, but there are these. Um, these chemical media that can extract heavy metals. Alternatively, if you have um, some manner of algal filtration, whether it be like ch chato in um, your refugium, chato reactor, algal turf scrub or something, algae can bind up heavy metals and by removing um, the algae, you can remove the heavy metals. Third thing, aggressive water changes can help you. Apple asks, do you run carbon? Um, sometimes. We don't run it 24-7, but we run an analog. We, we do use uh, ozone, which does have some benefits that um, 
what's the word I'm using, thinking of? Have some overlap, like the Venn diagram of ozone and carbon. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming you're meaning activated carbon and not carbon dosing. We do not do carbon dosing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Reef return. Thank you so much for the super chat. Where are you from? What is DKK? What is what? What currency is that from? Thank you for all your fantastic videos made in top professional quality. I appreciate it. I'd like to do more, but I'm kind of bad at YouTube <laughs> in terms of actually just getting production out there. But thank you so much. C then thirteen. YouTube member, Steven13. Hey, Than. I've been having trouble with dinos. I have a UV setup and upped my nutrients. Have you ever heard of removing fish and corals and dropping salinity to try, try to kill dinos? I have not heard of that. Um, what I have heard that tends to help is trying to do some kind of oxidation. So um, ozone tends to help. And also, uh, and I'd go really gentle with this, but hydrogen peroxide, some kind of like active oxidant. <clears throat> Bay Area reefs, what is up? Sir, I am recovering from a cold or flu or something. And I'll tell you what, these cough drops are really helping. Shout out to Ricola, not a sponsor. But they're, they're, they're helping quite a lot. James recently had a bacteria bloom that took out everything. That sucks. Um, all but the Ghanaian zoa that I got from you. Tank is doing great again. Now going to stock up. Nice. Sucks that you had a bacteria bloom. Sometimes... I really think that right now UV might be the most underrated old school tech that's out there. Like there's certain techs, like uh, you know, tools in our tool belt that they they just like stuck around and it's like tried and true, like protein skimmer, no doubt. For 20 years, UV fell out of favor, but it fell out of favor specifically in the home reef aquarium thing. In public aquariums, they've known what's up. Sometimes they, you know, get other things wrong, <laughs> but they did not get UV wrong. UV has always been good. Um, I don't know the context, James. James Sulima, ultra lober brain or scalemia coral. Um, I don't know. I, I so like I'm thinking, did we see something on stream that was one or the other? I don't know. <laughs> so please, please uh, expand upon that thought if you would. <clears throat> Kevin Johnson is suggesting Brightwell Pirate. I have not used that product, but it is, I believe, in a similar vein. Metazorb. Turf algae, poly filter, yep. Greg Best, does the ozone take away the bad aquarium smell? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, reef return, uh, DK, DKK is Danish crowns from Denmark. Funny you're that you're from Denmark. By the way, again, thank you so much for the super chat. Um, Denmark has recently come on my radar as a place that I would like to visit for something completely unrelated to um, to the reef aquarium hobby. There is a restaurant there, a very famous restaurant called Noma, that um, that it's always in the running for like the best restaurant in the world. It's like the same restaurants seem to pop up in discussion every year it's like 11 madison park in new york it's the french laundry in california it is every now and again alinea in chicago 
There's a couple of places in Spain, um, and it is Noma in Denmark. So, yeah, that is one place that I would certainly like to certainly like to try. It's like a bucket listy thing. I'm not like a super mega foodie, but when I travel, I really want to to kind of um, take advantage of the fact that I actually left the house. <laughs> so there. <clears throat> Lucas, thoughts on fauna marine? Um, I don't have a lot of strong opinions. For the longest time, just mainly because I've only used like a handful of their products ever. But for me, and this is kind of like dating myself but for the longest time they were like the gold standard for lps pellets um which is ironic that we don't currently use lps pellets for anything but um if i were to go back to, to hand feeding like you know like a single pellet to lps corals and stuff like that the the fauna marine lps pellet was magnificent Gecko Man 11. What advice would you give for someone adding corals to fish only with live rock tank? I would prioritize corals that your fish are not going to eat. I don't really know what fish you have, but um, even, even the most nibbly of fish, you can kind of navigate around their appetite and find some um, coral choices that could work. Also, depending on uh, just like how nutrient heavy that tank is, that's also gonna have to be a consideration. <clears throat> Greg Best, good to know. What system ozone would you recommend for approximately 160 gallons? So this is the beauty of ozone, guys. You really only need the smallest of the uh, Ozotech units, like the Poseidon 200, I believe. Uh, we use a Poseidon 200, which again, is the smallest ozone unit that they sell for 2,500 gallon systems. And it is not turned all the way up. Like you will be fine. You will probably run that thing at its lowest setting 30 minutes a day. It's fine. Mark Gardner, what are your thoughts on adding amino acids? I wish that they were not as effective as they were because I was happily not paying any attention to them for the longest time. Uh, they're nice. <clears throat> Once we did start to pay attention to amino acids to the extent that we were trying to get our numbers off of zero, we weren't trying to hit very specific numbers as far as amino acids go. Uh, I will touch on that in just a sec. But once we started to do some amino acid additives, things did get a lot better, noticeably. Part of that could have been we were having some chronic issues that we also fixed. So again, it could have been like, well, you dealt with these systematic issues versus now also correcting um, now correcting the uh, trace element. I think I just literally got confused when I read amino acids, but mentally I was thinking trace elements. Um, so yeah, sorry. All that thought was for um, was for trace. Sorry, my screensaver activated. Um, amino acids we feed uh, specifically to our acropora-based systems and they tend to help. <clears throat> um, what are your thoughts on fauna marine, especially balling light? No opinion. I have not done it. Andrew at ICP Test Hub. Yes, go to Denmark. <laughs> Lies. Than is a foodie. Um, 
So, like, but I'm not, though. That's the thing. Uh, I'm a foodie in the sense that I have gone to nice restaurants. But uh, my day-to-day, it's more like not the best food ever. (laughs) Reef Return. Yes, Noma is awesome. We have quite a few restaurants here which are considered top, top. That is always interesting because, like, um, when I was in Japan, um, the Michelin Guide had recently rated a bunch of restaurants in Kyoto. And there's a lot of three-star Michelin restaurants in Japan, like a lot. I think that Tokyo has more three-star Michelin restaurants than like any other city, including Paris. And if you know anything about Michelin being a French company, there's a heavy preference to French cuisine in Michelin. Anyway, what I thought was funny was that the Japanese that, that were hosting us were absolutely not impressed by the Michelin Guide's opinions of Japanese cuisine at all. They were like, I can't believe they gave this restaurant stars and not this one. And long story short, like one of them finally said, you know what? What do we care about what the French think of Japanese food? And that is so gangster. And that is why Japan has so many Michelin stars because they don't care at all. They know what's good. And I I have a feeling that the, the local cuisine in many of these countries, like in Denmark, that there are like some local favorites. Like you can go to, to the famous restaurant, right? Um, and I do like to do the famous restaurant, but I also like to get like the local flavor as to what the locals think is fantastic also. So for example, in Japan, there was a uh, Netflix documentary called Jiro Dreams of Sushi. And his restaurant is called Sukiyabashi Jiro. And I had to go to that restaurant just for the novelty of going to a three-star Michelin restaurant that was the subject of this particular documentary. And I did it. The local Japanese are like, yeah, it's fine, but there's a hundred other places that don't have a three-month waiting list. That's one-third of the price. That sort of thing. And I'm like, I get it. I get it. I will try as many of those as I can also. But for the simple novelty of a well-known restaurant has some value to me. Anyways, guys, sorry about that little tangent. <clears throat> Anthony, I got my first saltwater tank back in October. What corals might you recommend that are affordable that I could fill it up with? And are there any placement techniques? It looks a little too empty. Okay, so when you're looking for affordable, believe it or not, there's a lot that you can choose from. Most corals will probably be fine. I think that the saltwater reef hobby especially gets a bad rap for being inaccessible because of price and also um, overly challenging for the median reefer. And really, um, most of the really challenging stuff tends to be at the fringes, like SPS corals. Most of them are actually okay, but it's acropora that are going to give you a hard time. It's going to be certain corals that have like weird care requirements, like non-photosynthetic. Wouldn't recommend that. Everything else really occupies that middle ground that is highly appropriate. And look at what's on screen right now. There's a $10 coral. So as long as you are not trying to to dabble with the hottest in-demand coral, you can find good deals out there. Another coral, $22, right? But if you're looking for some something crazy that, that's highly sought after, yeah, you're going to be paying $800 to $1,000. Is that a good idea? Absolutely not. Not for a beginner. Um, not for a lot of people, to be perfectly honest. But there are deals. There are plenty of deals to be had. <clears throat> Mike Gervaisi. I lost all my Zaws, and I can't put any more as my coral-safe fish love them. You'd be surprised at how many uh, coral-safe fish 
eat coral. Um, certain things like fox faces, they eat coral. We put up with it anyway because they provide such a benefit. Certain tangs will eat corals. We have a Vlamingi tang in our 600 gallon tank that, and we cannot keep certain LPS in there like Duncan's because he'll just eat them. Can I use live phyto as an algae scrubber? Not really. Um, no, so they're, they're kind of doing different things, right? So live phyto is typically a food source Whereas an algae scrubber, it works because you're removing it. It binds up all those nutrients and whatnot, heavy metals, and then you are physically extracting it from your water. So unless you are putting in live phyto and then physically extracting the live phyto, which I don't imagine you're doing, it will not have that same effect. Economical reefer. Is constant carbon dosing beneficial for corals and water quality? Uh, you're kind of asking the wrong guy because I don't like carbon dosing and bacterial filtration in that way. Uh, it's never been um, something that's been a very robust technique for us, and so we don't do it. Uh, it's if it's something that you want to dabble with understand that it's kind of razor's edge-ish. If it goes the wrong way, it's going to go the wrong way badly. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm visiting family for Easter and hijacked their new OLED TV for this stream. And my God, does it ever look good on it? Thank you, Jordan. So one thing that is slightly different about this particular stream is that I got a new internet connection and it is just good enough for me to stream at a higher data rate. So I'm, I started with a much beefier um, output file. So what's going on behind me on the green screen is, is starting with a 4K image that's then downsampled to a 1440p live stream, which probably looks pretty darn good. <laughs> probably looks pretty good. Be back later. Thanks, B. Thanks for hanging out. I'm going to be here for a little bit, little bit longer. We're on what, item number 96 right now, and I believe we go to about 220 something, so got a little bit further to go. I don't want to jinx it, but I'll jinx it. Um, so far, the cough has been managed. Reef return. I have some red rash on my right arm these days. I think it's because I've messed up a lot with Ganyapora species these days. Have you ever heard of this? My arm has become weak, not serious. So weak is not good. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, reef rash is absolutely a thing. Um, I used to get like uh, get rash as well, um, not nearly so often these days. Supposedly, over time, you get more susceptible to it. Um, if it is something that is a concern to you, I would look at starting to do some kind of chemical filtration of the water. So, for example, um, doing something that could interrupt a lot of those biological uh, compounds. So things like UV, things like ozone, or just straight up activated carbon plus additional water changes. Because you want to to knock down whatever it is that you're, <clears throat> excuse me, having a reaction to. Because leaving it as is tends to get worse, not better. Mike Gervaisi, you were the one that said fox face last time and you were spot on. Yeah, I mean, fox faces do like to nibble on certain, on certain things. Um, and it is kind of like hit or miss as to what they'll ignore for a certain time. Again, most, most fish that are reef safe tend to ignore corals just fine. 
but anytime that you're messing with fox faces, tangs, or butterflies, um, and many of you will be surprised to hear that yes, there are tangs that can misbehave, um, you're always at some degree of risk with that. <laughs> Julian George, I haven't seen one of these in years. This is so exciting. I forgot how comforting your voice is. Thank you. I've been uh, I've been dealing with a little bit of a cold lately, so I have to be a little bit more deliberate about what I about how I talk, just because it's like I feel like I want to have a coughing fit all the time. <clears throat> but it's getting better. Uh, I've, I was sick for a good week, and uh, most of it I felt okay. But there was a stretch there, which was not very fun. Not very fun at all. Oh, man. So if you guys missed earlier, uh, I was talking about how... I was able to finally upgrade my internet connection. So I don't have like gig fiber, but I was able to beef up my output, um, my, my upload speed to a point that um, I was able to get a halfway decent um, data rate through. And I'm looking at my broadcast software and it's like, it's so, nice to see that like we haven't had any dropped frames or anything like that everything is just like coasting right along so pumped to see something actually work out for a change it's not a problem i wish it was just snot like snot like in my nasals that would have been fine the worst part is like it's in my lungs and it just takes so long for me to clear out my lungs so you just get like, it's it's like this annoyance, right? It's not even that like, oh, my lungs hurt. My lungs don't hurt anymore at least. And there's actually not a lot of stuff in there. It's just like this little, little bit of like scratchy irritation. That's all. <clears throat> reef return. Curious about fox face. I have one, totally reef safe. For now, um, your mileage may vary. We have them in almost every tank here. What do you think the benefits are? They are a top tier herbivore of specifically macroalgae. So there's a lot of different types of macroalgae that you really want to get mowed down. Uh, so they do a good job with Valonia. They do a good job with Ulva, which is like a sea lettuce. If you have Calerpa, that's definitely going to get eaten. Um, what other things do they do a good job of munching down? Certain turf algaes, perhaps. Yeah. In general, though, it's um, it is it is a little bit challenging to find herbivores that do that well with. Um, with macroalgae specifically. So I put them up there with nasotangs as far as like their ability to do that. Will M, why are bicolored dotty backs so mean and nasty? Uh, you'd be surprised, but most saltwater fish are pretty mean and nasty. Uh, chief on that list, Clownfish, Finding Nemo lied to many a novice, <laughs> um, they're mean. Uh, tangs, very mean. Damsels, very mean. But yeah, Clownfish, they're a non-starter here. Like We have maybe two or three in this whole place, none of which we acquired intentionally. They're all like rescues. And anytime anybody wants to offer us one, it's like, nope. <clears throat> Travis Clements. I was looking for you at Reefstock, but we never crossed paths. You missed a photo op with me or the other way around. 
Reef Therapy 100 was a good watch. Thanks for all your work. No, oh, I appreciate it. Um, reef stock was a, a blur of activity that was a little bit cut short. So uh, part of it is um, I was busy doing a lot of stuff at the studio. So uh, I was in go mode the minute that I landed. Like as soon as I landed in Colorado, um, I was already on the way directly to uh, the studio to record that that um, reef therapy podcast because I was already going to be late, and it turns out that we were the first to show up because it's a madhouse to do anything at these events. So anyway, we got that all shot. Uh, I was around pretty much all day Saturday. And Sunday, I was gone for about a three-hour stretch because I went and saw uh, Dune Part 2. <laughs> I'm like, you know what? <sighs> my my hometown here is such a disappointment. The closest theater to me, which is about five, ten minutes away, permanently closed. So, by the way, this is not a small city. Like, it is a good mid-sized city. And the place that I live is not just like the total boonies. It's boonies adjacent, sort of, but it's also one of the most affluent areas. You would think one of the most affluent areas in a relatively good-sized city would have, you know, enough people to support a theater, like a movie theater. Not so much. So when I was out in Denver, I was like, you know what, I want to see Dune, and I want to see it in IMAX, because there's really not a lot of... A lot of IMAX is in the entire state of Ohio. So seeing it in IMAX, good time. That did, however, cut dramatically into my showtime on Sunday. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, economical reefers asking. Any tips on making SPS corals chunky like they came out of the ocean? <clears throat> yes. Couple of things. One is you really have to stay up on your on your water chemistry to make sure that they have enough um, building blocks to grow that skeleton. So in addition to like the calcium, alkalinity, magnesium, and your trace also pay attention to like strontium and stuff because strontium in many ways is like a calcium analog so you will want to maintain those levels very consistently possibly slightly elevated but the real big deal thing and this is where this is where it's going to kind of suck is the flow that you need to generate in your tank to make them grow tight is pretty extreme. Pretty extreme. Um, you have to provide enough flow that they grow like that, but not too much flow that you're blowing the flesh off of your corals. So good luck. <laughs> Reefing with O. Oh, thank you so much for the $20. I cannot seem to get Monte keep Montipora alive to save my life. Any tips? Montipora? That's kind of surprising. They tend to be very forgiving. Um, what tends to make Montipora struggle? I think if you're in, a, in an SPS heavy aquarium, sometimes people might overrate their ability to handle bright light. Because you would think that a Montipora would like very much the same sort of conditions that an Acropora would, um, but perhaps not as much light. It's also possible to have Montipora-specific pests. Um, I don't know if you have like any um, ability to see like the nudibranchs, but if you have Montipora eating nudibranchs, you have a Montipora problem straight up. Can't imagine what else could be bothering Montes, really. I mean, the only time that we ever really struggle with Montipora is 
is if there's like a pest thing and um we in fact stopped bringing in new montipora for years now because uh getting wild montipora in specifically the risk of of pests on wild monties is extremely high so if you ever guys were wondering like you know hey is it a good idea to get like an aquacultured one versus like a wild one that's like five times the size for the same price get the aquacultured one because if you ever have to deal with montipora eating nudie bronx it's really not fun it is one of the most challenging things to get rid of in your system <clears throat> Scott, hello. What is the counter in the top left corner? That is a uh, that is a reference to color temperature. If you look, we are doing a special effect that shows the lighting change that goes from a daylight coloration, which is a lower Kelvin light, to a more actinic coloration, which is a higher Kelvin light. And so that's what that's doing. Nail salon was a bust. I forgot it was Easter weekend. Back to buying coral. <laughs> it's an SPS heavy aquarium. The Acropora are doing well. In terms of pests, I don't know. That's just the next evolution of my reefing journey. <clears throat> Unfortunately, pests are very prevalent. Um, as much as it is comforting when people say that, yeah, it's like, you know, these are like pest free corals, um, it is un. it is. I was going to say it's uncommon to find a retailer without pests, but uncommon is not quite the right word for it. Nearly impossible is closer to the deal. So a couple of things. Um, and maybe there might be like some tiny boutique shops that can, that can dodge certain pest issues in the near term long term that's much more challenging um, any place that is bringing in wild corals um, I'm gonna call cap on that <laughs> uh, it is the the amount of stuff that comes in on on freshly imported corals is extreme uh, let's see yeah and in long-term culture at scale I think you're always going to be dealing with some some degree of pests. That is the reality. And as a hobbyist, uh, if you are again have like a small nano tank that you're like really fastidious about cleaning and keeping an eye on stuff and really diligent, you can dodge a couple of things. But time is not on your side. The likelihood that you will spend your entire reef career without dealing with every pest the only way that would be possible is if you're not in the reef aquarium hobby for very long over the long term you will see everything and yes i mean that is assuming that you have um, very good pest control procedures and quarantine and all that the pests will defeat you. They're very good at what they do. W J H Drew. I gave up a bit on Montes when I found Nudie Bronx eating my Montes in my system. They're very, very, very difficult. Um, there's, there's some pests that are basically not even pests. There are some pests that are definitely a problem but are easy to manage and then there's pests that are both a problem and nearly impossible to deal with and unfortunately montipora eating nudie bronx occupy that s tier nuisance they're difficult <clears throat> mike well my just looking visit turned to a slightly under 1k visit thanks thanks mike i appreciate it helps to keep helps to keep the lights on 
but it is it is easy to spend a lot on coral. That's that's for darn sure. Matt Smoyer, been absent from chat because my hands have been in the tank. I get that a lot, where it's like this is a nice thing to have on in the background while while uh, people do maintenance. Yep. Very next line. Love listening and doing tank maintenance. Yeah. So uh, I do have to make a quick announcement. Um, the we're we're having another one of these in two weeks, just because of how scheduling worked out. It was a fast turnaround on this. It is going to be slightly different. I'm going to have a friend over, and so uh, between now and then. I will publish, I will absolutely do this, I will publish a podcast going over his tank that is now three years old. We've chronicled um, the progress of the tank from when it first arrived, sitting empty all the way till now. It's looking really nice, and uh, we spent about like an hour or so chatting about all these sorts of things. And so that'll be a cool thing for us to... Um, to show you that podcast during the week. And then that weekend, um, we'll have him on as a guest so he can answer any questions that are kind of floating around out there. So a slightly different format, but same sort of stuff. Corals in the back. <clears throat> Lots of lights that need to be kept on. That is for sure. Reef return. If you remove the Montes, will the nudibranch then starve and die? That's a really good question. Um, so, possibly yes. Possibly yes. Um, they do eat other things, less commonly so. They do eat Anacropora. Uh, and I have heard that there are some varieties now that eat Acropora. Also, the reason why Montipore eating nudibranchs are so difficult to deal with is that usually people just take the Montes out and dip them, you know, look for eggs and whatnot. Uh, the nudibranchs go all over your tank. Like, there, there's certain types of pests that only sit on the coral and don't really travel nearly so much. The nudibranchs travel. So, Oftentimes, your dipping procedure is circumvented because you didn't dip all the nudies because they weren't on the they weren't on the uh, Montipora when you were doing your stuff. So removing all your Montes for a year might be a good way to go about it. Um, and here, here's something that I always heard. This is like not so much of a hot take, but it's the idea that. Um, uh, I'm just going to start with fresh cutting, meaning that there's no base because the base is where all of the pests occur. Since when? Like, I, I mean, sure, there are things that go on at the base, but there are plenty of pests that are on the flesh of coral, like lots of them. I guess like, so the, so the idea of like, oh, you know, like fresh cutting only, will circumvent some, I'm not even sure if it circumvents much of anything. Like the whole point of pests is that they're on the corals and they will be on a fresh cut if they're there. <clears throat> the silent one, I quit the hobby. Salt is now 80 to $85 or more. I'd rather buy other things at that price. Fair enough, yeah, salt is expensive for sure. Salt is one of those things that has like been relatively consistent in price for like a really long time. And uh, it's one of those things that's oddly a loss leader, practically. Because, you know, for as much as people like to be so like tribal when it comes to salt brands, like people treat salt like it's Coke versus Pepsi sort of thing. And it's baffling because it's not like salt is a high margin product. Like if you had a store and you're selling boxes of salt, you'd be shocked 
at how poor the profit margin on salt is. It's basically not there. The idea behind salt is that maybe because of brand loyalty, you might buy other products in the line that there is better margins. But yeah, salt is just one of those things. Kind of sucks. Oh, the biggest problem with salt is that it is a 40 pound box of salt. Like the transport will always be an issue. Like filling up a truck and emptying a truck. Uh, I'm trying to think, like, how much is it to ship? Oftentimes, the, the shipping bill on salt is four figures. Just in freight, it sucks. And that's if you're buying it at good enough volume that it makes even any of that stuff worthwhile. Yeah, guys, shipping shipping semis full of solid material sucks. <clears throat> that's basically why I gave up. I did multiple... <sighs> Screensaver. Uh, let's see. Been about a year. I did multiple dips. Killed the nudies, but the monkeys still look like they were getting eaten. Yeah. Yeah, it sucks. Shipping salt is murder as far as cost of shipping. Yep. It is bad. Fauna Marine, hello. Greetings from Germany. What is up, Claude? May, is it Claude? <sighs> Mike, an issue I've dealt with now for a few months is diatoms on the sand, though I haven't added salt in at least three months. Um, yeah, so diatoms is one of those things that tend to take care of itself in a more mature aquarium. It really sucks when you're going through it, but there's a number of things that you can do in the near term that will help. And then once things kind of um, settle in a little bit, um, you generally will forget that you ever had the issue, which is nice. But until then, you kind of have to struggle. <clears throat> It's, it's, it's so bizarre because like diatoms is one of those things that sucks so much to have to deal with when you have to deal with it. And every other time it's just a complete afterthought. It's like, oh yeah, I forgot that even existed. Huh. Then you almost have to like Google up, what do I do about diatoms again? And it's also like a, one of those things that, that's so virulent that it, uh, it does its thing and it's like overnight it's gone. And it's like, oh yeah, of course, it's so easy. But when you're really like struggling with it, it's like the least easy thing ever, right? This tank is three years old. Okay, it's not necessarily about the age of the tank. It's more about getting like the the, the biology like settled in. If you have, if you can get into the nutrient range that is kind of attractive for like coral and just about everything else, you all, almost automatically are out of the range that diatoms do really well. Like diatoms do, um, they do really well when you basically have like no nitrate and phosphate. Um, but usually once you get into like the, like the, the, the safe coral pocket, that is an unattractive time for for diatoms and at that point any of those treatments will make um, a lot of headway into dealing with diatoms <clears throat> reef return I've used ATI Absolute Ocean for a while. It's a liquid concentrated salt, which is everything in it. A bit more expensive, but it's easy to just add to a large container, give it a shake, and then use. And that's cool. I use like the most boring salt imaginable. I use Instant Ocean. Super boring. 
Apartment Reef, man, what is your opinion on ICP? Logically, I'm struggling to identify the conclusions that we see hobbies coming to when fundamentally the water mist is going into a plasma ball reduced to the elements. So <clears throat> I, I look at ICP as a data point, but um, I don't slavishly look at the numbers as like the complete and utter truth to it. A couple of reasons why. Um, the tech is very uh, user error prone, um, like talented technicians that are able to do that type of characterization. They're in very high demand in very high paying industries. And so I don't know the how good the techs are going to be when some of these test kits are just simply not that expensive to, to do, like $40, $50 for a test. The industry going rate for some like uh, some like mass spec type tests, it's like $200 for a test. So, I mean, one of the tests that we've used is under $20. And I'm like, how is that even possible on paper, right? So part of me is like, you know, there's like this slight bit of mistrust there. I would consider using it as far as like trending analysis, that's fine. And for me, just getting numbers off of zero, close enough, you know, horseshoes and hand grenades, so to speak. But um, if you wanted to dial in numbers using an ICP, I don't love it. They don't love that practice. So Fauna, they do um, some ICP testing as well. I'm sure that they will weigh in with some with some opinions as well on it. For our systems, um, we've we're really not that evangelical about any particular brand of test. Um, I would suggest perhaps sticking with a brand and looking at trend. Um, it would be challenging to evaluate different brands. I think that Reef Builders had a couple of articles kind of touching on that. And even I think in their conclusions, it was probably not the best idea to be dialing in specific numbers. Yeah. <clears throat> Having said that, when you're able to when you're able to see like the obvious big picture problems, that is that can be very helpful. Like uh, we were not really messing with trace elements for like the longest time, and once we started to dabble a little bit with that, things did start to pep up a little bit. Uh, I did mention this before, but our tanks were going through a couple of different problems, one of which was uh, we kind of accidentally chlorinated our RO. Um, so like literally our, so like, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> mixing the salt water in chlorinated water, not a bad thing. Topping off with chlorinated water, that's not great. So that caused all kinds of issues for a little while. Uh, we have since fixed that. We also had a weird uh, heavy metal issue. And the heavy metal issue was because, uh, we think, because of a lot of rusting magnets in our tanks. Uh, we used to just, this is just, uh, just changed our practice. But we used to have um, like an algae scrubbing magnet in every single tank, just for sheer convenience. It was always in the water. And eventually, you know, even the ones that are completely sealed and everything like that, these seals do break down. And you eventually have like a magnet in there that swells and breaks and rusts. 
And so we did a quick audit and it was like eight to 10 different magnets had basically ruptured or had taken on water. There were a few, um, a few pumps that had uh, magnetic impellers that had split and rusted. So all of that we think contributed to our heavy metal issue. And once we got that cleared up, a lot of our SPS immediately rebounded after that. So was it trace on its own? Perhaps not. Like fixing obvious issues will go a long way. But anecdotally, we did start to mess with the trace and that did, that did tend to help a lot. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, let's see. Okay, real quick. We have hmm, about an hour and change left to go. But before we do, I want to quickly say the thank yous to the sponsors. Okay. So it was kind of an oversight on my last video. Uh, usually we put like the sponsor overlays and um, it was probably still fever dream me uh, doing the editing. So I had neglected to put those on there. So first off, thank you to our corporate sponsor, Polyp Lab, and basically you guys on Patreon and YouTube members. So real quick on Patreon, we have Elaine Martinassi. Aline Barley, Alan Jackson, Ann Lewis, Brandy Camp, Chuck and Meyer, Greg, Greg Zimmerman, Harkins Aquatics, ICP Test Hub, speaking of ICP, uh, Jordan Marty, Keith Singer, Kyle Jamison, Lisa Clow, Lacry Fine Art, Lynn Holt, Puddle Aquatics, Ryan Baker, Scott Williams, Skylar Korn, Sue Hammonds, Thomas Tarrant, and Tim Garner. And on the YouTube member side of things, we have William Heights, Carlos Fernandez, Chris Jordan, Steven13, Mike Downey, Keith Holland, Terry Kuhn, Herb777, Justin Harden, and Ohio Ventures. Thank you all so much. Sorry guys, doing some tech support for my moms. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm trying to think what else is going on that's kind of interesting. We've been, like I said, we've been getting through some um, some of the projects that have been going on here, and it'll be nice to get back into um, both cleaning up all of the existing systems. We were so far ahead at one point, and we were having like all these guests coming over. And so it was like perfect, perfect storm of like maintenance and all that stuff. But then uh, I got sick and then some pet projects jumped in the way. So um, I'm expecting that like within the next couple of weeks we'll be back on that horse. Uh, but the other thing that's nice is that by getting done with like all those pet projects and stuff like that is I can hunt down some corals that I've been looking for for a while. One of which happens to be this like diaceris. It's called like an insanity plate. Wish I had a picture of it for you, but it's kind of like fuchsia and green, I think. Anyways, the going rate for those guys is about 700 to to $1,000 for a frag. 
And right now, that's like one of the only corals that we're really looking for. There's a couple here and there, but that's one that I really want to add to my collection. Gabriel Berkey. Hi, Than and everyone. Welcome, Gabriel. Good to see you. <clears throat> I don't know what you guys have planned for like the rest of the weekend, but I know what I'm doing. I'm relaxing and have to get over this stupid cough. Oh, it's so annoying to be like just laid up with this. But I also do have to to edit that one that one podcast with my friend because that's been that's been on my to do list for a little while now, and I want to make absolutely sure that I get that done before um, before uh, he shows up for the live stream. Okay, let's see. Apartment Reef. I've been trying to convince Jack at Reef Builders to do a Ganyapura tank. So there's that. <clears throat> I want to do a Ganyapura tank. Every single time that I've wanted to do, to do a Ganyapura tank, um, it's turned into something else. Like... We've got these two show tanks that are facing one another, and one of them is a Fimbriophilia show tank, and the other, at one time or another, we've wanted to do a, basically a 250-gallon Ganyapura tank. And um, I think what happened was we were also just like temporarily housing some Colorado sunburst anemones in there and it, they had their own basket and you know as you know about how that typically goes the anemones escape and over time that just became a Colorado sunburst anemone tank <laughs> like the entire thing so right now I think that's literally that's the only thing in there other than the fish and the snails and whatever else but it's like no coral just Colorado sunburst and for the longest time it looked kind of dumb because we only had like a couple Colorados and they weren't that big but now those things are gigantic I think the biggest one might be every bit of like over 12 to 18 inches across and there's so many of them now it's one of the most striking displays and there's a there's a period of time in like the late afternoon where it is only blue light in there and it looks practically fake because the the light is so blue that it mutes the rock to such a large degree where the, the rocks almost look black and you're only seeing like this ridiculous glowing anemone and anemone like there's one there's like a dozen of them in there now but and they're so big and like the, the motion and everything like that it's like one of the coolest displays but that did kind of sabotage the Ghani and Pora show tank didn't it <clears throat> it would be cool um one of the the, the bummers though but when it comes to Ghani and Pora is that we typically do well with most Ghani and Pora and they've been doing much better than they ever have like in the history of the hobby right they used to be considered a doomed coral but nowadays most of these people most of the people in the hobby are able to keep ganiapora now the super long-term culturing of ganiapora i think is a little bit trickier than people let lead on um like for us, a lot of them do really, really well until they don't. And then they'll kind of like just like close. And occasionally we're able to get them to bounce back, sometimes not so much. And it's really challenging to figure out exactly why that is. Because it doesn't really seem like we do a lot. And we kind of just prophylactically um, start dipping these things and uh, nothing really comes off of them. It's not like, oh, well, there's a clear coral pest. There isn't. 
Um, so my thinking is that it might be like microscopic practically that could be like the ailing thing. So when we start to see stuff just like close what seems to be inexplicably, we'll just start to like put in like a treatment regimen in there and then a lot of times it does bounce back. Um, I guess that kind of rolls me to like another tangent as to like kind of like what is and what is not coral farming. Um, I was like talking, I think this was at Reefstock and um, they were asking like, do you think that, that such and such is coral farming? And I'm like, no, not really. It's like, he's like, do you think it's just chop shopping? And I'm like, at best, I, think, I forget exactly who I was talking to, but anyways, the industry folks. And they were surprised at my take on that because they're like, how, how is, you know, this activity not coral farming? And like, I was, the way that I, I should have described it at the time, I just didn't have like a good way to explain kind of like why I didn't think something was coral farming or not. It's like a sliding scale because I think that there's going to be a lot of differing opinions about what is and what is not even aquaculture, right? But how about this? <clears throat> On one end of the spectrum, would this organization be able to survive if they were not allowed to acquire corals? Not even trading, not wholesaling, nothing. They're unable to acquire new coral inventory for 12 months. Would that place still be in business? I'm going to go ahead and guess that the vast, vast majority of stores that self-identify as sustainable coral farms could not stay open in, with no ability to acquire new corals. Let's say, for example, there is a full shutdown of both Indonesia and Australia. Full import ban, full export ban, whatever. No corals are coming in from, from the two largest geographies, right? Um, I'm going to go ahead and guess that a lot of places are going to like dramatically struggle. But if they're also not able to acquire corals at all, that's going to put like a nail in many a coffin, right? Um, would we be able to do that for a year? It would be very gross, but possible, which is more than a lot of people can say. But then that's like the ultra extreme, right? Because if, if you're having like that kind of like hard line bright line rule, then nobody's coral farming, right? And that's probably unfair to a lot of good activity that's going on out there. So I said, it's a sliding scale. Where do you, as like a, you know, just like a person in the zeitgeist, where would you draw that line? Would it be like, would you be able to survive a month? Which it's like, that seems pretty normal in some places I don't think could even do that I think uh, there's there are there are plenty of places that are very active in aquaculture that rely on 20 boxes per week to maintain their operations so yeah I mean it's it, it, it I guess like when I was having that discussion um, at reef stock it, it's kind of framed in that in that sliding scale it's like where are we exactly what where are you when you're describing coral farming so i am kind of curious what the community thinks about that <clears throat> there's been a nasty cough going around glad you're on the mend thank you yeah it's not been that fun um Originally, I, I just thought it was food poisoning because it was like I had gone out to a restaurant that had clearly fallen off, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've I've got I've got a food poisoning from this uh, hamburger I had." Took care of it. The next day, I kind of like felt something in my throat, but it was not just my throat; it was more like in my lungs. I'm like, "Oh, I'm screwed." 
Okay, apartment reef. What do you think of sumps on 40 breeder or less? I love sumps. If you wanted to do a 100 gallon sump on a 40 breeder, go for it. Yes, glad you're recovering, sir. I'm getting there. I mean, I was really hoping I'd be like done with it by now. I'm not done with it. Reef return. Time to get ready to watch Manchester United. Thank you for the wonderful live show. Thank you. Enjoy. Enjoy your football. Apartment reef. In my eyes, farming means something like what you had during the closure, I think, that you're referring to. Yeah, <clears throat> we were very much not impacted whatsoever by um, Indonesia closing. Like not at all. One of um, one of the wholesalers that we that we do a lot of business with, uh, they had to trim off like fifty percent of their staff. I, I didn't realize like how much Indonesia played into the um, the overall import, the size of it. But I think it was like seventy to eighty percent of all corals coming in were from Indonesia. So that was like a big time bomb of an event um similarly uh fiji as a geography has opened back up and all these corals uh are coming in from fiji now and there was like some excitement um in the industry initially until um people realize that uh fiji corals aren't that nice <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. It's like it's kind of a hot take, but uh, there's like a couple of Fiji corals that are nice, and everything else is just kind of there are other analogs to those that look better from other geographies. So the fact that it comes from Fiji is kind of underwhelming. Uh, but going back to the coral farming thing, one of the, the corals that people were very excited about was getting yellow Fiji leathers again. And um, that is a coral that we never lost because we were, we've been actively farming it for the 10 years or something that Fiji was closed. Now that they're back, uh, they are not that highly colored <laughs> coming in straight from the ocean. Um, it's one of those things that like, yes, believe me, they are yellow Fiji leathers. The reason why they don't look that good is because they color down during transport and most home hobbyists do not have the lighting intensity to bring them back to a canary yellow color. Um, those corals are found in very shallow water under a lot of light. And I think that in order to get the brightest canary yellow, you're looking at like 600 to 1,000 par or something. It's not for everybody. Uh, let's see. Um, Armony Custom Jewelry Design. How is the life sale works? Okay, so uh, your best bet is to go to that pinned comment right at the top or in the description of the video. It'll take you to titlegardens.com slash live. And on there, there is a frequently asked questions thing. So if you would like to purchase corals, you can go to titlegardens.com slash live, see all the stuff that we have for sale. And it it is basically an online storefront. Put stuff in your shopping cart and check out. Uh, just as a buying tip, you actually have to completely check out in order to get the corals. Uh, just having stuff in your shopping cart does not reserve you the corals. So if um, if there's like a lot of activity, uh, some people could buy corals out from under you, so you have to be careful of that. Generally speaking, not an issue, but you do have to fully check out. <clears throat> A 
aquariums down under. I feel like for a coral to be called aquacultured, 100% of that the piece of coral has to be grown within an aquarium instead of chopped and healed in an aquarium. That is a possible definition. The only um, the only thing that I would put a little bit of pushback on with definitions like that is that there's no auditing process to verify um, the claim, right? If, for example, this aquamarine chalice that you're seeing on, on the site, on right there, I can pretty much guarantee that there isn't a single molecule of that that's ever seen the ocean. But how would I, how would I even prove that? Um, I mean, this is a, this is a chalice that we've had for years to the point that I don't remember when and how we got that. Um, these zoas, we don't acquire zoas all the time. So this has probably been in our collection for years also. I can't imagine these were from an original colony that we got from a wild thing. If, if we got from a wild thing at all, a lot of our collection came from other hobbyists. But I guess it is the, uh, the, the, the what is it, the, the trust but verify part? <laughs> How do you verify any of that? That's where, yeah, things can get kind of tricky. I mean, this is, again, the nuclear holocaust version of, this is how you verify, no imports for five years. At that point, everything in the hobby, it's going to be aquacultured. <clears throat> but short of something like that, right, there's, there's not going to be a, a great way to tell. Nothing I know of anyways. Maybe there's some more creative folks. Have you ever found yourself with access to Xenia eating nudie Bronx? I have not. We love Xenia here, you guys. We love it. It is one of the, okay, I don't know, Xenia, Xenia is problematic for some folks with smaller aquariums where they're, they are at risk of overpopulating, obviously. This is not a problem on the commercial end of the spectrum at all. Like I have no problem with like a giant tank going crazy with Xenia. Um, and a little piece of me freaking loves like the Red Sea pulsing Xenia. I think it's one of the coolest corals ever. Um, I have no problem with having an entire show tank that's just Red Sea pulsing Xenia. It's the coolest thing. And it sells well. <clears throat> Apartment reef. Yeah, that's why it's so hard for ORA Bioida to get hard corals into Canada. Yeah, and I suppose it doesn't help that Canada is a relatively small market. I mean, Canada has fewer people than California, right? Um, kind of an unfair distinction because, like, I think California might be like the fifth largest economy in the world or something. But, um, yeah, for somebody in the U.S. to send coral to any other country, it's almost not a good financial move just because of the size of the aquarium industry in the United States. There's really no need to export out of it, even if it is just across the border to Canada. <clears throat> so I am really unhip to the to the import export game, um, but they don't. Um, so so apartment reef said CITES papers don't transfer to F two F three. Correct from my understanding, it's like you don't get to farm coral and then export it as a new coral anywhere. The way that it's done is you get to re-export a coral that got imported. So, for example, let's say you have a Xenia rock that came in from Indonesia. 
you grew that thing to an entire show tank worth of Xenia, right? Where practically all of it is aquacultured now. You're able to sell or to re-export one thing of Xenia. That's it. Like the and as, long, and as soon as you use that re-export, you can no longer sell any of that Xenia in that same fashion to another country. Yeah, yeah it's very, very bizarre, right? It doesn't... Some of these things don't really make a lot of sense in that regard. Um, I think that there are some carve-outs for aquaculture, but not quite there. <clears throat> I don't have a good answer for you there. <sighs> Hello. My Duncan colony won't open after a water change. What do I do? Um, it's a little weird as to like why it wouldn't. Um, I don't know how long it's been closed, but generally speaking, if it's closed temporarily, it's not a big deal. One concern would be, was the water change for some reason particularly stressful? Was it like not mixed well enough and that's causing like like a stress shock was the water temperature like that far off that it's causing some kind of shock if it's a shock thing might take a little bit of time to, to come around but yeah it's it's kind of unclear long story short you probably just have to wait if you wanted to be extra proactive you might want to like do another water change, but try to make sure that all those figures are as close as possible to avoid that type of shock. Have you ever found giant Bali Xenia that sits on a single stalk? Um, I believe so. It's been a long time though. And the pulsing simularia. A long time ago, we had pulsing simularia. It's kind of cool. Um, I suppose if I looked really hard, I could reacquire it. But it's not like, it doesn't pulse like Xenia pulses. It's like simularia that every now and again, the little hands do this. And it's tan colored, like peach tan color. So I don't know if like the the taste level for that makes it a good product. Hmm. It's been closed for two days now. I did a 50% water change after my feather duster died. The red flag for me isn't so much the water change, but why did, it, why did a feather duster die? Yeah. Hard to, hard to tell without doing like the full diagnostic and kind of like seeing what other possibilities are. Is it possible that something is eating the corals? <clears throat> like a fish that should be behaving better that's not? Yeah, like especially like a big feather duster dying. Not normal. Gabriel, if you were going to start a new tank, what would you spend the most time doing? I think hard plumbing would take the most time. Um, so for me, the sort of thing that I have the most fun doing with new systems is trying to plan out the ergonomics of it to make it as easy to maintain as humanly possible. The better of a job I can do with that that sort of stuff is the things that excite me, like having a sump that is accessible from at least three sides. I like that. <clears throat> I like sumps that are not underneath a tank. 
I like it that it's completely open air so that uh, that makes like maintenance and everything like that that much easier. I like oversized sumps. I like um, very easy access to drainage and sinks and water delivery for both fresh and salt water. All these things are the things that that I like to spend time thinking about and implementing when we're talking about new tanks. Ruben. <clears throat> My new Monte Digitata doesn't have great polyp extension, stable parameters, and I'm growing multiple SPS coral. The only thing, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> the only thing I can come up with is low nutrients. Um, <clears throat> this has been kind of a recurring theme, but if Montepore Digitata does not have great polyp extension, I worry that there is something eating the polyps. <clears throat> Apartment reef. Man, if I could only add one thing to a tank, emergency overflow box on the sump that drains to the outside in the event of an of a sump flood. That's a good one. That's a good one. <clears throat> Matt Peng. Hi Than, software engineer. Do you think there's any market for software engineers in the coral industry? Um, real talk. Too small of a niche. <laughs> Julian George, slow the footage down. It's too close to the end. <laughs> we are coming to the end of it. You'll know because we uh, we are finishing off with a few anemones, I believe. I forget exactly which number, but it is coming to an end. And I need to do something about like my cough still. <clears throat> it's gross. I'm surprised I didn't have to get up and move. Lucky, lucky. But I'm very much excited about taking it easy for the rest of the weekend and um, kind of just recovering. Like, it is, it is no fun being out for an entire week because of something stupid like a cold. It's like the most frustrating thing. It's like, I don't think I get enough done as is. And then like when you get sick on top of that, like you definitely don't get anything done. So dumb. But anyway, guys, I hope that you all enjoyed yourselves. Um, hopefully you're having some better weather than we are. It's like, it's absolutely gross in Northeast Ohio here. Very rainy and wet. But um, yeah, hope you enjoy what's left of the weekend. Your tanks are doing well. And the next show, it's a fast turnaround. We, um, we're going to be back in a couple of weeks. Uh, hopefully, we'll have like a nice long uh, podcast to talk about with, uh, with Nathan. It'll be a good time. His tank is like super cool. Uh, it's like a nine foot long tank. And we've kind of chronicled the whole thing from three years ago till today. So, you know, you know, we shall see. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I just want to say appreciate you for doing these talks. You don't have to, but I don't see any other vendors doing it, so thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it's fun to do. It's, it's also just a little bit of interaction. It's nice every now and again. Because, like, I don't get out a whole lot. Anyway, guys pretty much it from here i will see you all next time you know something like that right uh oh, one last little psa i guess and yep that was it uh we will be starting to email people that had placed orders starting tomorrow for shipping sometime next week if you do require a specific day, feel free to email us at support at titlegardens.com. But generally speaking, we like to, to get everything sent out like Monday, Tuesday um, in that time frame. But if you need a specific date or something like that, you know, just reach out. 
if for some reason you accidentally paid for multiple rounds of shipping, um, Ben will take care of that once um, he starts to actually do the shipping labels and whatnot. So anyways, you will be refunded for all that. Okay, guys, that's it from here. Take care. Bye. <clears throat>